we'll get started. Want to welcome everyone to the second webinar two um, around the topic of autism spectrum disorder. And we're happy to have two presenters today who are part of the writing committee of these. So um, both of whom you will remember from last year, Janine Small and Stefan Bone. Um, just as we get started, you'll also notice that we are recording this session and so it will be available to all members of the three principals associations on our respective websites. If you have a question, please drop it into the chat or the Q&A function. We'll be monitoring both and Luciana will actually take care of making sure that we're keeping an eye on those and singling those questions to Stefan and Janine. Uh, Judith, who's another member of the committee, may also chime in on some of the responses if she, if she would like to do so. And the other piece that I would like to let everyone know about is that we do have closed captioning enabled. So if you want to enable that for yourself, you just need to click on the, the CC button there at the bottom of your screen. You should have a couple of options there where you can have closed captioning, which will just be um, a running text at the bottom of the screen. If you want to do full transcript, that's another option. That option will pop up as a side window and you will see who is speaking. You likely don't need that option unless you prefer it because we'll, it, the only people who will be speaking um, outside myself now and Luciana at the end will mostly be Stefan and Janine, but if it helps you to know who's speaking and have that name there, then by all means, go ahead and use the full transcript. Beyond that, I think you see the, the topic here for, for today, um, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary in education, definitions, objectives, and evidence of effectiveness of such teamwork. And so that that's, will be the topic for the next year. And your questions are always welcome. They add to the quality of the session. So don't hesitate to bring those in. As I move into the land acknowledgement, I will be reading the land acknowledgement for Toronto. I would invite you in the chat to share with us the land on which you are um, from wherever you are in the province and that will help us to have a more fulsome appreciation for the different lands of our province. I acknowledge that I am on the traditional territory of nations within nations, including the Anishinaabe, the Ojibwe and the Mishisagik. This land has been and continues to be home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. I would like to acknowledge the enduring presence of Indigenous peoples on the land, on the lands on which I gather with you today across Ontario, and I thank the past, present and future caretakers of this land. I am grateful to have the opportunity to work and learn on these lands in a community of sharing. As users of the land, we must continue to work to keep it clean and use it with care so that generations to come can also continue to benefit from the land. And thank you to those who are adding to the chat with the lands on which you are. And I would invite everyone to just take a moment and, and think and be grateful for how you use the land and how the land supports you and how you, um, how you live your life, how you play, how you work and um, we all benefit from the land. So just taking a, a moment to acknowledge that. And as we continue to do that, I will turn it over to Janine and Stefan. Great, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Nadine, for that. Um, for, as we move through this webinar this afternoon, I invite you to think about a student with special education needs and or a family for which you have served or worked with where the relationship with the student and their family was not positive or presented some challenges or some concerns. What we're offering you today is a way to revisit that situation or perhaps think of uh, situations that may arise in the future, rethink your approach and strategy to develop then implement more engaging alternative approach. Today, we are looking, all of our webinars have been linked to the Ontario Leadership Framework. Um, today's webinar in particular will focus on, or well, will support principals and vice principals in uh, improving the instructional program. 
So to ensure the best possible learning experience for yourself as you are here engaged with us today for this webinar, please allow for about 45 minutes or so of your time um, with opportunity for follow up as we go through the session. So who, who help us? get to know who our audience is. We do take your, uh, your feedback and, and, and again, understanding who our audience are to inform our practices as we go forward. So as you on the screen, you should see um, just a few questions for you to answer. We'll give you some time to please answer the questions. Thank you. Sarah, will you let me know when I can continue? I think you can go ahead, Janine. Okay. Thank you. All right. So thank. Oh, it's, there we have a. We've got a few elementary teacher uh, principals. Sorry. Um, and we've seen the results that are there. Thank you very much. Uh, current positions. Etc. All right. Thank you for that. So at least we know who is in our audience. We've got a few people from our south and our central regions. All right. So like our African um, proverb, it truly does take a village to raise a, a, a child or student uh, to support a student with autism. So think about um, of a student in your school with autism or special education needs. Um, who is that village? Um, is there anyone missing from that village? Uh, who else brings valuable information to the table? Does everyone have a voice at the table? Is the village working towards a common goal? So today we are going to discuss how to make our village larger, where everyone is heard and working together. How can we make our teams more inclusive, um, more powerful, and where we can celebrate successes, but also come back together as a team to decide and look at solution when it's not working. Um, when, we, when is it okay not to have all the answers and okay to look to others for a solution? So this is, these are examples for what uh, a transdisciplinary approach is all about. Imagine what we can achieve when we are all working together to make our schools more inclusive and safe for all of our students. So by the end of this webinar, you will have a sample tool for which uh, you can use, as well as gain understanding of what tr the transdisciplinary approach is, um, looks like and what it really entails. So leading the way to successful inclusion is setting an inclusive tone. So the first step to inclusion is certainly building on your knowledge and understanding about your students, your communities and families you serve uh, developing authentic and trusting relationships that embrace and honors the voices being heard and those not being heard. So the more you are able to draw upon the parents and guardians in your circle of trust, the more um, successful inclusions will most likely be. Um, the inclusion of every member of the team will lead to inclusions of students and of course build on their success. When we talk about um, Pool, uh, pooling perspective and wisdom is all about ensuring that there is a cohesive um, membership of all of our teams. So I ask you to reflect on different tools that could be used to gather information and to build trust within with your students and your families at your school as we move forward. Now, these are facts that are supported by research. So take a moment to look at these facts. Does any surprise you? And I will point out in terms of number one or this first fact over here. So student academic achievement in inclusive classes is comparable or superior to that of students served 
and can self-contain classes. Inclusive classes improve students' adjustments to community living, and inclusive educational programs have no adverse effect on the academic achievement of students without disabilities or exceptionalities, I would say. So these are supported and research, supported by research um, as, as well. So these are just things for us to think about as we move forward. All parents um, should feel welcome in the school, be involved in school related activities and in the life of the school. And I know you all know this, but I will say that there are many families for which they do not feel welcome. They do not feel a part of the school community. So we do have to make sure that we are taking um, explicit actions to ensure that families feel uh, welcomed and part of the community. So needs, there needs to be a clear uh, in school process to examine and challenge discriminatory biases in the learning materials, uh, in our programs and practices related to anti-oppression and equity. Um, we need to pay particular attention to the mistrust of, inter of, the, of institutions on the part of members from, for example, our Black community, our Indigenous communities. Um, are like our families, or like our students rather, our families are diverse, rich in culture and experiences, and we need to set the tone that value them as contributing members of, um, and supporting the goal of student achievement. We also need to ensure that we are consulting with parents and actively seeking representations, particularly uh, we think about our indigenous communities as we think of all of the communities and, and across Ontario, we, within your schools, you know your communities, you know for which the students for which you support. So we need to make sure that we are in consulting with them as we move along in our processes. When we, are, when we talk about inclusion and getting to know our students and their families, we also need to examine our own biases. As we are generally inviting families and parents to the table, we have to start with our own biases. What does that mean? Where are we coming from? How do we understand um, how we uh, interpret and represent or make decisions? So when we talk about two things, unconscious bias refers to that bias that can result in our prejudice or stereotyping that may influence our, your actions and decisions that can lead to discrimination and create barriers for our students and their, fam and their families. Uh, we also have implicit bias, uh, refers to attitudes and their stereotypes that affect our understanding, our actions and decisions in unconscious manners. So with the best intentions, we need to be aware of our implicit biases that may be impacting our, the outcome of our students um, and their student achievement. So I ask for you to think and reflect on what do you have in place to identify and safeguard students from biases, particularly as we support and service our students with autism. And uh, uh, Janine, if I could just interject, we have a question here from Blaine and he asks, is, is it safe to say that the success of students is related to a combination of good programming along with assistance to these students in the form of EA support, for example? You know, um, thank you for that question. It is, we all know that supporting all of our students is a combination of a lot of things. And there's also research to be, that does state and, and looks at what type of support and resources because sometimes our supports in certain forms of EAs or additional support, we have to look at does that impede or, or sort of stifle the independence of the students as they go along. So there is a place and time for when students can be supported by an EA, um, but I think and it is full rounded. So we've got support staff, but also as we go through, and I think your question is gonna come through when we talk about our in, uh, transdisciplinary approach, um, we'll hang on to that as well as we go through. Okay. Thanks so much. Never a straightforward path, is it? It's always filled with nuance and always the student at the center. Correct. 
So when we talk about cultural proficiency, this is again in line with getting to know our family. So the way, so understanding behaviors and practices that create appropriate mindsets that effectively respond to uh, issues that's caused by diversity and inclusion. And when we say that is you think about your classes, when we have inclusion, there are going to be challenges, there's going to be questions that are being asked or being raised. So as you begin to unpack your own biases and you also need to understand uh, the families and for the students for which that you service. So culturally proficient individuals, as we all strive to be, may, you may not know all there is to know about others who are different from yourselves, right? But yet we're able to take advantage of those teachable moments, um, those situations that may arise. Uh, we know how to ask questions without offending, or sometimes, you know, you do ask questions, there's a fan, but we, we probe more, we go into it, we dig deep into um, situation and how to create an environment that is welcoming to diversity and welcoming to change. We, um, so being culturally proficient, these are some um, highlights or some points uh, to consider. Um, culturally proficient is what we ideally would like to strive for. How do you think about these explicitly um, or being explicit intentions for our students with autism. So it involves knowing how to how to learn and how to teach about those about our different families, um, seeking to understand, seeking knowledge and understanding from our families. How do you enact the voices of your school community? You may have a small population of students uh, with autism versus other, but how do you make sure that we're actively uh, engaging all of our families? I will pass it to Stefan as we now go right into a little bit more depth into our transdisciplinary approach. Thank you, Janine. <laughs> I think really what's important and what has changed through um, the many years with, with special education is how we've evolved uh, to the point of looking at this new uh, way of uh, dealing with children with autism, but also dealing with other kids with severe behavior and, and mental health issue. It's the fact that the transdisciplinary team in the education setting would respond better to uh, the needs because at the center, you always have the family and the child. And then after that, it's the expertise is not based only on one person. The expertise is uh, really with regards to all the different professional, including the family around the table. So I think what we need to be looking at is really uh, expert in pedagogy, expert in behavior, uh, expert in also the emotional well-being of these students, but also getting the uh, family background, because if we're going to do what we call cultural practice, that means that we also need to keep in mind the values and the beliefs of these families with regards to services. So the expertise now needs to be focused on a team component and not just on one expert versus a group. There's also, we see with autism, for example, if I look at mental health problems in the school setting, we see that 70, more than 70% of children with autism, by the time they reach adulthood, they will, have a, they will have comorbidity. So that means they will have another diagnosis, which it can be produced by the environment or can be uh, predetermined because they were predisposed to other mental illness. But I like the question that was asked about success and having, when do we ask an EA to be part of the team and when uh, should that you know, student being alone? that would also respond with regards to the mental health problems. The more we create dependency, the more at risk that these kids will develop uh, anxiety, uh, social isolation, and that could lead to also depression. So, and also uh, and the, the words that always come to mind when I talk about inclusion is to be fully included, we need to accept neurodiversity. We're not just talking about autism and this adults that I've been working with, she, we had a big conversation about what inclusion versus integration and what she told me, and she's, she's uh, autistic. She said, you know, inclusion is about neurodiversity. It's not about me being autistic or somebody else being something. It's just a fact of within the beliefs, the attitude and the values that we accept everyone for who they are and not to normalize. We need to stop normalizing uh, people. Equality uh, for opportunity uh, is really important. Equity and social justice. 
uh, are all new concepts that really uh, fall into what transdisciplinary uh, is all about. So you can uh, switch. So if we look at the school system over the years, uh, we've, we've had this evolution and ex different experiences in education. We went from a consultative approach. For me, for example, that I work with CHEO, uh, I remember when the autism program started you know, coming in place in Ontario, we would have different teams that would go in the school setting and all that, and then meet with all these professionals and then you know, consult with them based on what they were telling us. Then we would provide them with ideas or suggestions. The consultative approach is very um, limited in what it changes within the practice of all the professionals because you make you know, suggestions, but you don't take into consideration the reality of what the teacher might going through or what an EA needs to learn. Uh, so competency does not work with the consultative approach. Then we went and, you know, I've been working now in 25 years in autism, but about 18 years with all different school board in, in Canada. And, and some of them are still within the multidisciplinary approach where, you know, all the members implement a specialist part of the intervention plan. The problem with that is, is the teacher often gets confusing messages based on the ter ter theoretical background of different experts. So if you get a SLP versus a psychologist versus a behaviorist, then they're getting all these recommendations. And then you get the person receiving that, you're looking at the child and you're thinking, how am I supposed to respond? So the multidisciplinary, you know, it works at the beginning but now it's not recommended within the school environment. So if I look at this, this uh, visual really shows us how we went from single disciplinary where the expert and for many, many years, it was the medical model. You get all these people coming in, the psychiatrist saying, this is my diagnosis. This is what I recommend. And there was no cooperation and not including even the, the family. Then, I, well, like I just said, where we went to a multidisciplinary component where you had different people working together, but they were all talking, trying to sell their own uh, vision about the issue or their own perspective based on their knowledge. And that also uh, did not focus on problem solving, but only on expert opinion. So again, people were, were still making just suggestion and not recommendation. So then you had these members cooperate. Uh, there they was some contribution, but it's not, we did, there was no common vision and we didn't know who was supposed to do the work or not. So then you would have the expert coming in, this is what I see, and then they leave and they don't come back. There's no follow-up. So there's no real teamwork. So the interdisciplinary, I remember when I used to work with one of the French board, we did uh, that approach where once a month we would meet. So we had a teacher, a resource teacher. Uh, we had these two school principal. We had the superintendent. I was there and other people where we would deal with all the complex cases with regards to autism. So everybody was there talking about the, the, that uh, child and then really focusing on problem solving because we didn't know what to do. Uh, they were suspended a lot. Sometimes they weren't at school. Uh, so they were in, in class and then pull out of class. We would put an EA, not knowing what the EA was supposed to be doing. So the interdisciplinary started you know, a, a nice process where we could start working as a team. But the big lack of, of, of communication came from the fact that the parents were never involved. And if you don't have the parents at the center with the child, and you don't build a team around them, then again, it's just having these different profession around a table and it, who's, who's gonna do the, the best sales pitch with regards to the need. And that also leads to uh, a lot of the boards and a lot of school principal in a bind because everybody wants an EA, uh, not, knowing, not knowing what question to ask. So the interdisciplinary aspect is quite limited with the creativity of what transdisciplinary can bring. A transdisciplinary approach, it's really creating a unity of 
intellectual frameworks beyond the disciplinary framework. So we're not looking at education. We're not looking at titles. We're looking at who are the best people to have around the table that are gonna be able to listen, are gonna to be to have a voice, and are gonna be able to share some knowledge about uh, little Stefan, for example. So they're solving problems, but they're going beyond the disciplinary perspective to involve practitioners, beneficiaries, and non-academia. And I think that's, that's the, the, the way to go in, in starting now, is to really bring new knowledge uh, with the, what we've learned from multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary concept, but to really have a real team effort where we work uh, as, a, as a group to identify the objective and who's gonna start doing the work and when do I uh, go in, what are the expectation uh, with regards to that. Okay, you can change. Uh, so like I said, interdisciplinary, uh, each team members put forth their knowledge individually and then collectively they try to have an intervention plan. So any of you that have been involved in autism for many, many years, like I did, remember when we had the, um, the transition team from the IBI coming into the school, how hard it was to get any information from them based on, oh, it's confidentiality. We're not supposed to share some of the aspect. That was more of an interdisciplinary approach. And this is why it didn't work for a lot of these children coming in. And it really left a lot of these parents you know, trying to, to really focus on one side, the medical world telling them this is, you know, your, that's the profile of your child. And then you get the education world saying, well, this is what your, your child is. And our recommendation is to be in a self-contained classroom or be somewhere else with 50% of an EA or full-time EA. And then you get a message from the other group saying, well, your child is, is independent enough that he should be able to function in the regular mainstream, that was caused by the interdisciplinary approach where experts sometimes think too highly of themselves and they forget who they're dealing with, meaning the child and the family. Transition should always be smooth with regards to you know, transferring knowledge into practice and not neglecting the family. So that's what transdisciplinary does is members are gently jointly responsible for implementing and integrated the plan. The best way for a school uh, principal or vice principal is if you have a team, it should always, don't always sit around thinking, okay, what are their strengths and weaknesses or their needs? You should ask your team to do a case study. You need to know as the leader of that group is what are all the information we have from home what are the information we have from observation? What, what have been some of the uh, evaluation that have been done? So it needs to be more a case study type of team rather than just meeting to uh, pinpoint what's not working and why we need an EA and why we need to find some another placement for a, a student, for example. So that's what transdisciplinary will do because it also brings the parents on board. So they, they will not be um, playing the role of the activist because they're part of the team member. So that means that they're part from the get-go. So all the information shared. And that also allows us to, when we're dealing with parents, because I do that a lot also in my practice, is to show them with facts, the reality and why, why they do need an EA and why sometimes they don't. But if the parents are always asking an EA, often it's out of fears because their child is nonverbal or because the child comes back home and they have no way of knowing what they've done through the day. So they're using the EA to be the voice, the eyes and the ears for that child. And that should not be the case. We're supposed to be promoting independence, especially in autism. And we should be looking at uh, inclusion. So Stefan, we've had a couple of uh, comments in the chat that look at uh, examples where transdisciplinary approaches are becoming reality. And it sounds to me based on what you've said that the principal actually has an extremely unique opportunity to be a catalyst for this kind of approach to start to happen. 
where you yes. may or may not need formal structures within boards to have that happen. But you as an advocate for that child and working towards what is a best solution can be that catalyst to bring that collaborative table together where everyone is seeking the best possible outcome for the child and the family. Exactly, and I think what's so important, and I always say, because I, I've, been, I've been working with some school principal in one of the English board up here, I'm coaching them how to supervise uh, teachers in the classroom. And, and I always say to, to the, the school principal, you're the leader. You're not the leader about content. You're the leader about leading your team to the best option best on, based on the information you provide to them. So the role of a, of a leader is to be able to gather all that information, to be a good listener, but also to ask the question that needs to be asked without always having to just say, well, I'll leave that to the uh, autism team. I'll leave that to the resource teacher. I'll leave that to that. They all know their role. I think when we talk about transdisciplinary is more about somebody taking leadership and asking the right question and making sure that somebody is doing something and they're not all working, you know, against one another uh, because of their, the, you know, they all want to help, but sometimes too many uh, players will have the negative impact on the child. But also for me, what's key is, is uh, teaching these leaders when the an EA is really needed and when it's not. What are the, the, the factors that really tells me that uh, an EA will be valuable and when is it just out of fear that the child will have a meltdown? Okay. Thank you for that, Stefan. And as we, as we move on and picking up on that is when we look at the evolution of our uh, transdisciplinary Move into our transdisciplinary uh, teams and approach, and we look at what ex what you know what has been your experience as you take a look of these at these based on your reflection of some of these. Um, there I happen to all have um, starting with C's here. What has been your uh, experience in working as part of a team? Um, how do you manage those conflict? What is the um, consensus around the decisions that are making? What is what is being consistent? So when we look at the transition disciplinary approach, it is certainly looking at collaboration with all the particular the classroom teachers as well to be successful. Everyone benefits from the partnership, including the support staff that are um, supporting the student, the parents, the families. Um, every member should recognize his or her own um, colleagues, expertise and vice versa. So in order to be a successful member, one should be exploring uh, the various skill sets that brings to the table. And as Stefan has said, uh, you know, as a psychologist or a speech and language pathologist, you all bring different experiences to the table for which we will, you know, you look, look at those and honor those voices, but we certainly would like to uh, explore more to, to, to know uh, how do we move forward. Uh, the decision would be done by the school principal because you are you are the lead you are there um, after reviewing all of that information uh, there's always value in working with our colleagues um, and decisions don't necessarily have to be made right away right on the spot because you do have to consider um, other information that may come may come in you also want to um, prevent professionals believing that they need to always be the one with all the answers or to constantly be reinventing the wheel. So we really need to be looking at each other and tapping into the knowledge that our peers bring to the table. Um, because again, this will only benefit all of our students uh, when we have successful collaboration. So and it's not just between professionals. The su successful collaboration is definitely with the family and the parents. Hence, when we started about getting to know who our families are, where, what are their lived experiences, their realities, their identities, that would help us build and honor in what they are um, and what they bring to the table. Here is an example of a tool for which you will at the end of the um, this webinar will also be sent to you or you will have access to it and it's a resource that is there. So the handout is designed to help you implement um, the transdisciplinary model at your schools or with your school team meeting. It is it is a tool for which you could use um, the role of the principal in is key to um, 
to working through the transdisciplinary approach at that meeting. So as the, as the principal, you're going to review um, the members of the team, who they are and what their defined roles are. You are going to set the tone of the meeting. You are going to set the pace of the meeting. Um, also principals, you must attend the meeting. So oftentimes you've got your administrator, vice principal, principal at the meeting, but when the principal is there, you've got, you're in the position to make optimal decision-making and identify the needs of staff and, and students and be able to plan going forward forward. There's phases to the plan. So in terms of phase one, the first phase is identify your, your, your team members and you're going to set up the initial meeting. This is your common vision. This is going to be your timelines and objectives that you're going to set with the team. Phase two could be done um, at a separate meeting or could be done sub, uh, you know, at a subsequent meeting or during phase one. And really it is, um, you're going to lead a discussion with regards to the implementation of the phases. So what is what is the presenting concern? Um, where, you know, answering our, our essential what, where, what, what, where, how, and when. You're going to delve deeper into the, into the issue in terms of collecting data, um, built in trust, sharing existing data, what is the data that you need. And you're going to also always keep in mind which voices are not being heard. So oftentimes as someone to come back to, you know, the EA support and the staff is the EA at the meeting, because sometimes they do have a different perspective, different lens that they bring to the meeting discussion, particularly if they're supporting the students individually. Phase three of the, uh, of the, um, the approach is really looking at um, everyone participating in the development of that action plan. And you want to make sure that there are clear goals, clear objectives. You're looking at your teaching and learning strategies. And as we presented in module in the first webinar about explicit teaching tools that could be addressed, because we know that you know other professionals, non-educational uh, folks that are at the meeting do bring a different lens to, to, to look at. Sometimes the students behave you know, in one environment and in the school environment, there is different. So we want to make sure we look at all our strategies and all our tools. And of course, what assessment uh, tools there are as well. Um, and you want to be able to track. You're going to use this tool to track the actions, um, making sure that there is accountability, right? So sometimes we have, you know, classroom teacher to be able to follow up on certain pieces. Maybe they were going to do, um, you know, um, ABC log of some sort, or maybe it's going to be a parent because they're going to follow up with bringing back some information. So it is a, a tool for which there is some accountability as well. Um, phase four, this is certainly the following up the meeting and you want to coordinate the implementation of the intervention plan. So you've discussed, you've put the plan together, and now you want to make sure that you are coordinating that plan and that all members are working together. So you want to be able to answer the questions. Are we on track? What adjustments do we need to make? Um, who is involved? Who is not involved? And you constantly want to be asking, whose voice have I not heard, right, in, 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 um, in going forward? Stefan? So the implementation of this uh, team approach is the when we talk about you know why would we do that when and what would be the process it's to reinforce the idea that every professional and parent guardian is an expert so the, the key component there is everybody's an expert within their own uh, field but also their own knowledge with regards to that student what's important also is the school principal is they don't need to have the expertise in autism. They don't need to have the expertise in, in everything. They need to have the expertise of, you know, leading a team with regards to finding answers. So the collaboration allows everyone to contribute uh, and also to make recommendation based on their own background. But after these recommendations, and that's where it's really interesting and powerful is even though all these people are making recommendation, the leader, meaning the school principal, after that would take all these recommendations and make sure uh, that he or she would ask questions to identify which recommendation are feasible. Do we have the resources for them? And when do we start? And what are the criteria that we are gonna use to make sure that the level of success is uh, assessed uh, regularly? So, 
there is the uh, so evidence base. It's easy to say that, but what are because really what we're looking for is uh, the child development from a cognitive, emotional, and behavioral perspective in autism, not just the be changing the behavior. Because if they don't learn the skills, they don't learn to self-regulate, then they have emotional issues. So if they don't have behavioral and emotional issues, there's no opportunity uh, for cognitive development. What has been hard and what's hard at the beginning, uh, it's to the finding the time and the scheduling can be challenging. But I think if it's done uh, in anticipation, uh, right from the, the start of the school year, uh, that could be uh, feasible. So I think you need a minimum of three to four weeks uh, in the school year for observations to be made and all that, and then call a meeting to see what's happening. Finding a common vision might be difficult at first because you will have people with strong mind sets around the table. So it's always, especially if you have parents involved, it's always to bring it back to the common vision and working objectively might be hard for some individual because of their emotional attachment. I had this question this morning about the grieving process of parents with a child with autism. Is it true that the, sometimes that, that does interfere with the objectivity? For sure, but the grieving part of it is also being, the more you're part of a team, the less you feel isolated and the more that you feel that you're contributing to the success of your own child. The guilt and, and the um, unwillingness sometimes of to, for us to be open to them really keeps them in this guilt and the uh, grieving uh, process of it. So respecting everyone's expertise is key, but not always easy because some people they have a uh, really strong personality and success will be dependent on respectful leadership and transparency. So the, it all starts with the leader at the table and that leader doesn't have to be expert in everything. He just, he or she needs to be able to ask the right question and also make sure that everybody's got a voice around the table. So what is then the advantages of working as a transdisciplinary team? So we know and is continued to, as Stefan said, building on that, the principals, administrators, you set the conditions for all voices to be heard equally, equally, but also equitable at the table. So to accommodate the various perspective and to make balanced judgment, each member of the team as the administrator, you would now have to understand that there are several important disciplinary perspective, as Stefan mentioned, that are relevant to every educational decision, right? Um, such as uh, we could, it could be related to cognitive, it could be related to our emotional or behavioral perspectives. Uh, we need to uh, ensure that the perspective of each relevant discipline or parent or at those voices at the table um, are being heard and that we understand what their concerns were and the voices that they bring forward um, and judge how important each perspective is for the issue at hand. That's what you do as a, as a leader, right? You, you have all these different perspectives coming at you, keeping the student at the center. How do you then judge what is relevant to that particular situation? You wanna evaluate the evidence or reasons um, supporting each of the perspectives to make sure that you have a full understanding and you want to include obviously all the voices as I continue to, um, to ensure that that's in there. Uh, of course you balance and you weigh all of the accommodations. Sometimes you have pressures from parents, you have, may have pressures from staff um, and all that different perspective in order to reach a reasonable and creative decision as well as um, a solution that could be um, innovative for that particular child and that particular meeting that you are having. And you wanna make a case for why the decision that you're making, um, you are making, uh, Com compared to other alternatives that may be there. So of course, there is lots of advantages um, to this per particularly uh, approach. Continuing along the way, you are empowering parents and students. You are supporting cultural diversity. Uh, you support identity and inclusion. And you want to be able to alleviate through the, the advantages is, is having the various team or uh, folks at the table and the various partners at the table, you alleviate the complexities relating to um, the student success by creating a powerful, um, you know, web or link or network of, uh, of folks 
uh, proficiently through parents. Of course, you've got your teachers, you've got your community experts. Um, we're all working together. And you also want to bring at the table your shared vision, a, a common goal, and you want to create that team. So you are creating the team to ensure that there is creative problem solving that's taking place. And that's part of the advantages of having the team. Moving, continuing on, when we look at the, oops, where did it go? Uh, increases in professional satisfaction. Again, teacher um, satisfaction, teacher feeling, um, you know, that support is being there, the parent as well, the students, um, enabling professionals to learn new skills and new approaches based on all of the suggestions that were there. Uh, and you're encouraging innovation. So it's not just one idea, but we're looking at various ideas to build on. Um, uh, as the principal, you need to pull, you pull the team together. You are the leader and you identify and support um, as needed, supports uh, creating positive um, learning environment and creating for positive change. Every decision that you make has a direct impact on student learning and outcomes. And it's important to consider all the solutions and be open to new ideas as you move forward. Yes, we know within our boards and within our schools, sometimes we are limited to uh, resources that we may have, but I think that's where the innovation and the creativity comes in ensuring that we are finding new ways to solve problems with the resources that we may have within our building. And it's important from this particular event, for our teamwork event, is that it's 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 okay not to have all the answers, right? We're 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 leading as we go along. We do not have all the answers, as we say in terms of being culturally proficient. Uh, the team does a the team approach creates a safe environment for yourself as an administrator, for those at the team, for parents and for students. And we look for the best approaches because if we bring we bring it together as we are working together as an open, um, a, a open unit, then yes, the environment will be safe for us to take risk and to be able to ask those questions and try different things. And as Stefan says, the whole idea of giving that uh, through the various phases is you can always come back after you know, having some time to observe, implement, and we come back together as a team and discuss as a team what worked, what didn't work, and perhaps what what's our next step and where we need to go. Okay. Stefan? So the transdisciplinary uh, approach, what it does, it, it uh, provides uh, opportunities for parents and caregivers to be team members. Uh, that's, that's really important. And also members are from at least two disciplines. There should always be at least somebody from the uh, education component uh, because pedagogy is very important uh, with the differentiation and all of that. And also somebody from a behavioral or emotional uh, aspect uh, members function as a team, uh, decisions are made jointly, uh, members share the perception of a child's abilities, consensus is formed regarding child, a child's abilities, concern, and possible methods of intervention. So when we talk about who should be starting the work, uh, if it is an EA or, or somebody else, if they're doing observation, then these observations should be shared with the team and based on these observations, then we start looking at what the child is capable of doing, what are some of the concerns, so what should be the plan, what should be the priority. Consensus is formed regarding the services necessary to address the goals and outcomes. So you need specific goals and you also need specific outcomes. What are you looking, what are you targeting uh, with, the, with regards to that child? Members, uh, participate in uh, role release and also members learn different perspective of the child through the perception of their fellow team members especially now and I think I want to just put emphasis on that autism is not just about behaviors autism is now recognized as a neurodevelopmental disorder so you need somebody on that team that understand executive functioning that understand the reality of autism from a developmental perspective, not just a behavioral 
perspective. So that's why when I was saying it's, it's good to have the autism team, some members to be around, but you need also a teacher, you need the parent, but you also need someone that understand uh, executive functioning and because that will play a big role in the intervention plan. We also hear the, the saying, fairness is not sameness. Also, um, equity is not equality, right? We treat every student the same. We've heard these, whether they have autism, Down syndromes, or physical disability. Uh, this type of approach does not provide students with what they need. So we do need to be aware of um, dangers of being disability blind. Right? We cannot treat every student the same. Uh, in order to create the best learning environment or outcome for each student, um, we need to recognize that each student is in, in unique and need to uh, be treated as such. With that being said, we also have students you know, with autism, you're on the spectrum, they've got the various needs as just mentioned, but also their families, right? Their families come from different uh, perspectives as well. So on top of that, we do have to be aware of all the nuances. So the key that transdisciplinary is more about, and as Stefan mentioned before, it's more about inclusion and not so much as just integration. Right? So there are differences when we look at, you know, am I going to be integrated into this environment, but am I really included? And are we really being inclusive in all aspects? So the student with autism, we have to take into account their narrative. Um, and the transdisciplinary team approach creates that inclusive environment for which we can um, act upon to ensure that the students are being uh, supported in every way possible at, the, at schools. Now here is um, this image here, I'm sure you can see it. This gives us um, sort of looking at the strengths for students with autism. And there are very different uh, points we can look at, creativity, integrity, um, absorb, retain facts. So there's various pieces to look at. I think what we want to point out is, you know, this is representing um, different behaviors of an individual student with autism. And we all know not all, not every student with autism uh, be, uh, display behaviors the same way or are the same. So I think knowing how to work with different families and adapting uh, teaching methods to the diversity of the students is, is key. Uh, this means that we have to build capacity to honor the ways in which the groups learn or our students learn. Our teachers perhaps need the understanding and our support staff. Uh, we must hold culture and diversity to a high esteem because that influences the way for which students learn and it brings to their, their strength as well. Seeking to add, to add the knowledge base of culturally um, being proficient practice by conducting research, meaning that we know if we don't know, we've got students and we do have to conduct some research to find out what, find out more. It's never enough to say, oh, I don't know. We're, we, if we don't know, we need to be able to look to the team for various answers, but also being able to be able to go out and find those answers as well. Um, we need to develop new approaches because what worked 10 years ago may not work now. What worked with your a staff that you had, you know, five years ago may work different because you've had transitions or trans, um, trans transformation of staff that has come into your building. Um, so you want to develop new approaches based on the culture of your school, culture of the students for which you are working with. And so, um, and, and of course, you want to increase your knowledge about others um, in order to support students with autism. We've also heard this where we know that diversity is a fact, inclusion is an act. And by putting this here, we just want and encourage all principals um, to focus on actions. What are the actions needed? How do we then use the transdisciplinary approach, using our cultural diversity, using getting to know our families and understanding to allow for cultural proficiency, to allow for diversity when it comes to serving all of our students with autism? How do we then build upon and continue to look at the students that you have in your building, consider the families and how, what's my next action? What is my influence as a principal in terms of going forward and moving and supporting students with autism in my building as I move forward? What we have, uh, the resources that we've used uh, so far today really is resources, um, trans transition guide, as well as shared solution. And we know that when we look at the um, information within shared, shared, shared solution, it does provide us with some 
um, points or I would say some templates how for how we can work with our families in the, in, in the event of there's conflicts. Now we started off by asking you to think of that student with autism um, that you have in your in your building that you've worked with where you've had situations that may not have gone, um, you know, may have been challenging. Knowing the information that we've presented here in regards to understanding the family and the transdisciplinary approach, how would you now look at those situation? What could you have done differently? What would you do differently in terms of ensuring that the voices of our families are being heard and that the team for which you are looking at does consider and the approach is more towards transdisciplinary approach. So those are things that we want you to think about as we move forward. Stefan, is there anything else you'd like to add? I think it's, uh, for me, it's really important. It's for everyone to, to just think about maybe using this approach and, and finding uh, ways to uh, better respond, but also take a leadership role because I think we need all of the school principal and vice principal to uh, lead uh, all the teams because the quality of service depends on leadership. Thank you. And with that said, in terms of any final words, uh, Luciana, I don't know if there's any questions in the chat or any comments, um, but I will ask that we will just invite you for a quick poll in order to uh, respond to some of our, our questions. That's fine. That's great, uh, Janine. We can go to the polls and then I'll do a bit of a summary after that. And I see that the polls just come up. Perfect. Thank you. So Sarah, we'll count on you to monitor the responses and when we flip to the uh, results of the, poll, of the polls. These questions will really help us in terms of shaping the final webinar that will be coming up in March. And Sarah, as you're monitoring that, uh, keeping an eye on the time, I'll, I will take a moment to thank our team today. Stefan, I think your final uh, sentences there were extraordinarily powerful in identifying how as principals and vice principals, we're at the heart of all of this and we can make it or break it when it comes to our students um, who are autistic. And it, it, it bears in mind, it bears repeating because honestly, uh, the privilege that we have in positional power is incredible. And for these children, their future can often be at stake. Uh, I want to thank each of you for participating in today's session. We had well over 100 people, and that is really awesome given everything that's going on. I'd like to remind you that the next webinar is March 23rd at 10 a.m., and we had questions earlier about accessing recordings and resources. Each of the associations have a web uh, page uh, dedicated to this work, and you can find everything from this year and last year, and I put the links in the chat if you'd like to copy and paste. We do have the results of the poll that have come in now. We really thank you for your participation. It looks like we have hit the mark in terms of timing and message, so thank you for your feedback on all of that. Uh, I'd also like to remind you that SpecEd for Administrators is an AQ that takes this work even further. And if you commit to your practicum for this uh, project focused on autism, you can, through your association, grab hold of a 100% subsidy for the registration. And we're just entering into the final year of that project now. If that's something of interest of you, go uh, for you at least, go to your association webpage and I'm sure you'll find everything that you need. To our presenting team today, Janine and Stefan and Judith, Thank you so much for all your work. Thank you for bringing your expertise and leadership in caring and in being mindful of how it is that we can do our work, especially when it comes to kids with autism in ways that make such a difference. Behind the scenes, Sarah Morrison, of course. Sarah, thank you for all your work. We look forward to seeing you all back on March 23rd. Please register if you haven't done so already. Make sure you reach out to us if there's anything else that you feel uh, we would benefit from in terms of our learning. We wish you well in the rest of the day that you have ahead of you. Take care and be safe, everyone.